<laughs> Mark already sent an email. So how are we? Maybe, maybe good, maybe great, maybe not. It's all okay. However we are, right? It's okay and it's welcome here. Today, we're talking about April showers bring May flowers. April showers bring May flowers. Do you believe it? Is it true? Is it true that we can have storm after storm, that we can have dead, dry-looking earth that looks like there's nothing there, but then the rain can come and the sun can come and the seasons can change and all of a sudden, there's a neon green, right? Do we hold to that truth in our lives, in our practice? To know just as the earth was created and formed in perfection, so were we. And so is our life. Even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it feels like there's too many showers, too much chaos, either outside or inside, can we trust the process and trust the practice? And how can we, as people on the path, use the practice to help the flowers grow? rather than standing in the rain and pounding on the ground saying they're not here. If anyone else is a little bit like me, I sometimes will look at those seeds and it's like I almost just want to pull them out. Like, come on, right? But you can't. You can't dig in there and get them out. You can't get them to come out any faster than they're built and designed to grow, right? So I want to share with you a couple of stories. The Daily Word was amazing this morning. I never read it before service. I like watching spirit do spirit's work. But it said something like, there may be days or even weeks on the calendar when I find myself mysteriously feeling melancholy or blue, only to realize the anniversary of someone or something is approaching. Have you ever felt that? About a year ago right now, Unity Village Chapel was having it's 100 years. Does that seem odd? Because we just celebrated it yesterday. Not yesterday, but yesterday, energetically. We just celebrated it last weekend. But about a year ago was the 100-year anniversary and was just after my 10-year anniversary. And we were coming off of, you know, the last few years of interestingness that we've all experienced opening the doors, closing this church, YFM, everything, opening it back up, staff rearranging. <sighs> I mean, if I take myself back to last year at this time, it's like total PTSD. Like, I can't even explain where I was at that time. We had, for our core positions, almost nothing in place and everything kept falling through. Like, I actually hired people, and it, then it didn't work, like, immediately. Like, ev every, everything was just, do you feel this ever in your life, in any area of your life, either internally or externally, whatever? It's like, whatever I did, and I'm, I'm doing what I know to do. I'm doing the practice, and I'm trying to hold down the fort, but I'm like, am I the minister of the Titanic? <laughs> and I, am I going to be able to sink this ship? Is this ship going to go down during me, my time here? And I started reaching out to other minister friends saying, like, oh, you know, this isn't where I thought we'd be. Like at 10 years, 10 years is a big deal for a minister, especially in a ministry. And I thought, I am doing something terribly wrong. Like something is not going well. Because to be here at this 100 years for this amazing spiritual community and to be here after 10 years of service and to walk out and to look at what I'm looking at is terrifying. People popping off the board, staff resigning, all these jobs out there, no jobs out there, every finances going down because people are scared or crunched, whatever it is. Can't take it off your taxes anymore, so that's the last thing to give to, right? Invested in whiskey. Just kidding. <sighs> it did not look like I thought it would look. And I, with the board, walked into a meeting in the early, early spring of last year where 
we were told after so much time of like not knowing what sanctuary, when, all these shifts, that all of a sudden, because the world has to look just like each one of us, right? The world has to look at what's happening, what we're doing, what we can't continue to do, what we need to rearrange, what new vision needs to emerge, right? So that was happening at Unity World Headquarters, looking at our spaces, how we use them, what's reasonable, what's right for right now. We've been in an 1,100 1, seat, is that really even true? 1,100 seat sanctuary. I mean, it almost, not look around you, and then all of you online can wave, but three quarters of you are online, and then look around you that are how many are in here. And we've been in an 1,100 seat sanctuary since the 80s, and Reverend Marianne Jones, who has been here for 20 years, she told me one time, because I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And she's like, honey, it hasn't been like that since like the 80s. or Like, I forget when, she said, but, but it's not you. And I called my minister friends, like, ah, what's going on? And they all said, oh, no, <laughs> you're actually doing really well. <laughs> Your finances are better than ours. Your attendance is better than ours in person. Your online is better than ours. And I had to look at them and lean into them and be like, are you sure for real? And look at church studies and research because everything I was getting from the world around was saying this is not okay because a rebirthing was happening, right? And I tried to hold to that. I tried to believe that and I stood in that, but I had to just get quiet and come back and hold to the practice. And it took everything I had not to run, not to tear it up from the outside or tear up the inside of what was going on. And God bless those of you who held me up. I gave a talk this morning to Unity in Canada, Unity in Ottawa and Kitchener. And you know, when I first took this position, ten, ten, now it's about 12 years actually, little hint, in September it's 12 years. But when I first took this position, I thought how amazing to be here. And you know, and I'd been in ministry for a while, so I thought I you know, had in my agreement that I could take off, you know, whatever Sundays that I needed and I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll like this is great. I'll be here, be able to nourish this community and then have Sundays off. I'll be able to, you know, travel and do guest speaking and, you know, speak around the Kansas City area and feel that out and like <sighs> It's been 10 years and I just did my first talk before this talk. <laughs> like, I literally have been like, I can't handle anything except for what is right in front of me. Like, do I try to do weddings? Do I try? No, I will if you really need me. <laughs> and it's not because I'm not good at what I do, right? I mean, that sounds arrogant and weird to say, but it's not because of that, and I know that, but it's because... I'm good at what I'm good at and I can't strong arm everything else and I can't be good at what I'm not good at and I'm at the right place at the right time at the right pace for me. And if I stepped into this position was like, no, this was my plan. This was my vision. I thought this would be great, you know, connect the whole movement back to the village, right? I'd have been gone a long time ago. And I had to breathe back into the present moment and take one step up at a time, right? Baby steps. And even when I said yes to Unity Canada, I said yes to two talks, one at the end of April and one at the end of May. And even this month with everything, I'm like, what was I thinking? Why did I say yes? Even with the amazing blessing of being with them. Because I had in front of me and in this time and place what I could handle. And for having been in ministry for almost 20 years, within myself and within the spiritual community and the congregation, the community online, the community, and all the ministers and the movement, I think this last few years, a lot of us have felt like that. And even if we didn't know it at the time, we may still be feeling the repercussions of that, of like, what's gone on in life? What's gone on in me? April showers bring May flowers. So we walked into a meeting when, you know, when I was thinking, like just at the point where I'm thinking, okay, please. Walked into a meeting that was like, okay, moving out of the sanctuary, moving into new offices, shifting everything, got about a month to do it. Start packing, start doing stuff. Everything is changing. Everything's changing. 
And the practice it takes to hold on and to pare down and to get to what's important and to watch the mind and to allow space when you want to run is incredible. And I was sitting in my office not too long ago with Mark Livingston um, working in the office and Aisha around and everyone here and looking at, like, we have the labyrinth outside of our window and look at this beautiful sanctuary we're in and it's such the right size, isn't it? It's so right sized, like you can see each other and our amazing community online. And it's right and all right for the ones that want to stay online, even if they live right down the street. It's right and all right if they don't want to come back into the sanctuary because that's how they like to do it. That's good. There are ministers that are sitting there going, get back in, get back in, please, for the love of God, get back in. Can you please come back in? Can we stop believing that when there are April showers, there will not be May flowers. Transformation and change is not always comfortable. It is not always easy. It does not always look like we want it to do, to look like, you know, or be how we want it to be. It does not always go how we want it to go. We have a beloved that's here, and she's going to give it to me after the service. But she's here in the service for the first time in a long time because she got some news about her family and needed to uproot her life and shift everything to support healing in her family. And she didn't know when she packed up a few belongings over an Easter ago, over a year ago in an Easter that she would be gone this long and she wouldn't be able to be back. And this community means everything to this woman. And boy, has my life been hurting since she's been gone. <laughs> Those people that you know they do all the things they do, but they lift people up and hold people up. And I'm sure it's been incredible and difficult and we had our 100 year, and I was looking for this person in our 100 year and didn't see them and thought, ah, still not according to plan. <laughs> but here now, and always here in spirit, supported now, and always supported in spirit. A part of this community, even when apart. Even when we're going through the most brutal things that we can't understand and we don't want. Even when it's like the showers keep coming. The chaos keeps raining. The inner spiritual work keeps disgusting you. Like, how am I still working on this stuff? Really, me? Like, really, Aaron? Really? Give me that flower, and I am going to peel its petals open. I want to peel its petals open. Can I take that desire and can I just take my hands and can I just lift them up and can I just surrender <sighs> one step at a time, ask for support, trust the process. You know, something that is often misunderstood about unity and the birthing of unity, the beginning of unity is Myrtle Fillmore's healing journey. Myrtle Fillmore went to a talk by E.B. Weeks and had tuberculosis or what looked like tuberculosis at the time and it was degrading her body and degrading everything and it looked like she wasn't going to be here long. Anyway, she went to this talk and she heard, you are a child of God and therefore you do not inherit disease or ill health, sickness. 
And in that moment, she got that, right? She got that, that that is truth. She got it in the cells of her body, in the core of her being. She got that God is love, that we live in a friendly universe, that I'm here to be supported, and that there is a wholeness in me. Whatever that looks like, there is a wholeness in me. And she got it, and she clung onto it, and she knew it in that moment. Even though she was in the middle of the April showers, even though she was in the middle of the chaos, right? In like a lion, right? It was the lion phase, and she knew it. And she held to that. And she knew in that moment, out like a lamb, may flowers. What a lot of people don't get from that story is that it's not that Myrtle Fillmore closed the door to that talk and walked out and had no symptoms and had no pain and had no physical discord. She still had the appearance of being ill. She still had stuff she was working out. It took maybe like a year or more before her body caught up with the vision. It took that much time. It took a year from last April and May for the outer here to look anything like what was planted in those April showers. And it took a practice. It took a practice of forgiveness, a practice of love, a practice of presence and being in the presence. So what in your life is calling for that? What in our world or in our internal being is calling for that? What's in like a lion that you know in truth can be out like a lamb? What is the April showers that you know in truth can bring the May flowers? Michael Singer, one of my favorite authors, I want to share with you a few quotes that he had. He said, what is in front of you is a very holy thing, all of it. Always, all the time. <laughs> what is in front of you, what is within you, all of it is a holy thing. All of it. He said, every single moment in front of you took billions of years with everything happening exactly like it did to manifest as it is. We know that's true. So then we stand in the middle of as it is going, oh, it is so wrong. How could this happen? He said, there are no problems. There are just learning experiences. No matter what happens, you are becoming greater. No matter what happens, you are becoming greater. But what do we do in the human condition? In the human condition, we try to press forward or try to get our vision here now, right? Like, And we often destroy things because we move and we push and we grasp and we make a lot wrong rather than letting go, lifting up, going inward, getting quiet. I have a friend who last year saw a turtle by her lake and the turtle by her driveway, dug a hole, went into that hole, and she caught the turtle, like right at the time, she caught the turtle laying eggs. And I saw the video, like crazy wild, these big white eggs plopping out of a turtle into this hole. And it was in the heat of the summer. And she researched it, the turtle covered it back up, and she researched it, what kind of a turtle it is, and when the eggs should hatch, and then she watched, you know, during the time that the eggs should hatch, she watched. She's watching. No turtles came out. No turtles. None at all. Never came out. Then I saw her just the other week, and she said, you're not going to believe this. And she showed me another video and picture. And think about divine timing. I mean, think about if there's a little spot in your grass by your driveway. And think about timing. Think about how often you would be at one place at one time 
to be able to see a turtle. So all of a sudden she's there this year in May. <laughs> Crawling out of the hole are turtles, baby turtles. We just had a winter and it's barely spring. The conditions were not right last year. There is something that happens with these turtles that if the conditions aren't right, they go into a hibernation. Oddly enough, only the males survive. I haven't unpacked that spiritually, but Charles Fillmore <laughs> talked it <laughs> in scripture as like the masculine are our thoughts and the feminine are our feelings. But it's like all the stuff around it, all the emotions around it, that didn't get to come. It was the true thinking that got to come, and the males emerged. But that's something that happens biologically. If the conditions aren't right for something to be born right now, it is embedded within them, the intelligence the right order, and the divine timing. Can we trust that in our lives? What if she had dug up those eggs? I just thought of that. <laughs> what if she dug up those eggs? Like, why didn't they, you know, dissect them? They were still alive in there. April showers bring May flowers. What is it in your life that you're trying to dig up, that you're trying to force, trying to push? I've recently been surrounded by my tribe of amazing women that I have. And one of the things I was just sitting with one of them looking at as my daughter brings up this puzzle and she starts taking it apart. And I looked at my girlfriend from college and I said, you're a puzzle woman too, aren't you? And I was like, what is it about me that all of my best girlfriends, my best people that hold me up are puzzle people, you know? And what is it like, you know, what is it that attracts you, right? Because sometimes you're attracted to a difference, right? And she took a breath as she's putting together the puzzle. And she said, it takes patience. It takes patience with the process. Puzzle people, please raise your hand. You have a pattern, don't you? You have a process. Some of you go for the edges first, and you put all the edges in places. Some of you go for the structures, the animal, the building, the tree, and you categorize into colors. And then you methodically, with patience, Sometimes day after day in your basement on a special table, you put one little piece at a time. You know, I cannot do a large puzzle. I think it looks like fun. I'd like to have a coffee or a cocktail someday by a fire and do it with you. But if it's setting out on my house, in my house, on a table, forget it. If I can't get it done, I've been like that since I was a child. If I want to do something, I need all the supplies, and I need them right now. I need it now. Dig up the flower. Oh, it shouldn't look like this. It should not look like this. Can we honor the spiritual practice and the spiritual path and give our nature the time it takes. How do we do that? How do we do that? We recognize right timing, right? Is there something in your life right now or in the world <laughs> that we can just recognize? I can surrender to divine timing. Is there something in your life where you're being called in to patience as a practice? I know for me, when I don't have patience, it's like I am pushing something. Pushing myself, pushing something. I want the answer now. I want the right now. I want the unfoldment now. 
Where are we being called into patience? Earth is like a demonstration of patience. April showers bring May flowers. You don't get the shower and the next day the plant comes. It's not like that. There needs to be a nourishing environment. There needs to be, for us, a practice. There need to be right conditions. Right conditions. Myrtle Fillmore didn't walk into that talk, get that God-ordained idea about her healing and her wholeness, and then walk out and negate it. What she did was she kept her heart and her mind open. She kept listening, and she created nurturing conditions around that. So what are the nurturing conditions in your life? What is it that grounds you, centers you? What is it that reminds you that no matter what the outward appearances are or the inward conditions and feelings are, what is it that holds you steady and keeps you in the practice, keeps you committed to your meditation, saves you to some degree? From Psalms 37, it says, be patient and wait for the Lord to act. Wait for the law to act. Wait for the source to act. Don't be worried about those who prosper or those who succeed in their erroneous plans. Don't give way to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. Those who trust in the Lord, the law, the source, will possess land, will inherit. And those in error, those things in error, those experiences of error and separation and discord, it doesn't exactly say this, but that's the metaphysics, it will be driven out. It says the wicked will be driven out. For some of us, that might fit. For some times in our lives, that might fit. But a gardener would destroy a garden if they didn't have patience. So what are the nourishing conditions of your life? What is it that lifts you up and supports you as far as your practice, your community, your life? What do you count on? What can you count on? I saw this story this week. It said at the World Championship in Budapest in June, the USA's Anita Alvarez sank to the bottom of the pool. Looking across the deck, then noticing she was underway too long, her coach Andrea Fuentes immediately dove in after her fully clothed, pulling her to safety. Anita was unconscious and didn't have the capacity to kick, paddle, or help herself in any way. If Andrea would not have noticed, she would have drowned. But she knew Anita. She looked for her quickly, and she noticed she was under too long and then dove in without thinking twice. The story said, this has resonated with me. When you are under too long, who are the people that will look for you? Notice and dive in, to pull you to the surface when you lose your strength to swim? Who are the people that would do that for you? And can someone count on you to be that person that would go looking and notice when they are under too long, diving in to support them, when they are all out of fight and fuel to swim in these turbulent waters we call life? What nourishes you? What cultivates the space and the support in your life to be fully present to the practice so that you don't go unconscious underwater? It may be meditation and a spiritual practice. It may be showing up in this community. It may be your friends, your tribe, the body of Christ around you. And it is certainly God. Because that which pulls us all up is the source of our being. And it is not in short supply anywhere. Can we trust that in our lives? That it is not in short supply anywhere. Right where I am, it is in great supply. Close with this from Eric Butterworth in Life is for Living. 
He said, the teaching of unity seeks to challenge you, and rightly so, to come up higher, to press on to the goal of your own divine perfection. You should make every attempt to meet your needs on the highest possible level and to put away childish things. He goes on to say, you should not make the mistake, however, of trying to make a child into an adult overnight. Take one step at a time in patience. And even if you cannot get up and walk immediately, you can keep your eyes on the goal while crawling forward. Patience as a spiritual practice. Namaste. <clears throat> so let's take a moment to breathe into this time of meditation. Just open your heart to this music, sound. Become comfortable where you are. Inhaling and exhaling. Even if your phone's going off, it doesn't matter. No one cares. And if they do, it's their spiritual practice. <laughs> Divine timing, patience. In the silence there is peace. In the silence there is unspoken joy. In the silence there's relief. From a world full of chaos and noise So I wait for these precious moments When I hear all that could never be said and right here in this holy silence, I find peace, I find myself. So we breathe into this time of meditation allowing ourselves to step apart for a while. A few moments, a few breaths, doesn't always seem important, but it can be everything. So we close our outer eyes and open our inner awareness, knowing God is right where we are, God is, I am. The same force that keeps this very universe in motion, that created this physical body temple with a, a liver, with lungs, with a heart, with organs, with systems, with eyes, with ears. That is what designed me. That is what has the pulse of my life in its hands. The same system I see outside of me where the winter comes and everything dries up and descends into the earth. Then brings the showers and the sun and day by day, moment by moment, unfolds the flowers. That is the force at work in my life. So wherever I am in the journey, on the path, in this moment, whether it's in the midst of gorgeous flowers or in the midst of turbulent showers, I can trust. I can breathe. 
I can know that I am whole and holy, that this life is whole and holy. I can breathe into patience, trusting divine timing, trusting the practice, letting go of looking to outer circumstances to see for confirmation or affirmation, and diving into the stillness, breath by breath moment by moment, in the silence. the power of this practice. May all beings have freedom from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings know that we're born blessed and here to be a blessing. May all beings know God as love and themselves as emanations of this love. Inhaling and exhaling. in gratitude for the life we've been given and the time and the form we give this life. And so it is. 